Thank you for joining us today for HPV, Everything You Need to Know. A huge thank you to the Iowa Immunizes Coalition and the Iowa Cancer Consortium for providing an educational grant for this webinar. Iowa Immunizes is a coalition of individuals and organizations committed to protecting the health of Iowans through vaccination of children and adults. Iowa Immunizes is supported by Iowa Public Health Association. Iowa Public Health Association is the nonpartisan nonprofit membership organization of public health professionals and allies in Iowa. Together, they work to inform the public, educate their members, and influence policymakers on matters critical to public health. Our webinar is being presented by Dr. Richard Deming, Dr. Mustafa Eldada, and Dr. Timothy McCoy, all from Mercy One Des Moines. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, you know, after your long day. I'm sure everybody had a busy day earlier. Um, today, you know, I just, um, I have the privilege to introduce two of my well-esteemed colleagues, Dr. Uh, Richard Deming. He's one of our radiation oncologists at Mercy One Medical Center. He finished his medical school at Creighton University, followed by his radiation oncology residency training in San Francisco, California. And also introducing Dr. Tim McCoy, who is a very well-known family medicine doctor for many years here in Des Moines area. He finished his medical school at the Des Moines University, followed by family medicine residency at Iowa Lutheran. And just to introduce myself, I am Mustafa Aldada. I'm one of the pediatricians at Mercy One Medical Group here in Des Moines. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us. Um, I would start with our objectives today. Uh, we're supposed to review the HPV in general, including Dr. McCoy's presentation about HPV 101. Also have some explanation about the vaccination rates and uh, Dr. Deming will talk to us about the ca cancer burden from the HPV infection. And Dr. McCoy will talk to us also about the announcement approach about HPV vaccination, which is something I feel it's very important for us to know how to introduce that concept in our clinics to talk to families about uh, the vaccine. Um, none of us, three of us, uh, None of us have any financial relationship with any pharmaceutical company or anybody else. So that's just like routine disclosure. Um, I will basically start the whole presentation with this nice Iowa map showing uh, our counties with the rate of vaccination. This is from the Iowa Department of Public Health. Um, you can tell from the uh, uh, color, you know, like the dark blue with higher vaccination rate and the very light one with lower immunization rate. So please look at your county, wherever you are practicing to see what's your rate roughly. Hopefully that will give you some feedback about what else we need to do. And with that said, I will uh, pass the slides to uh, Dr. Deming. At the end of our presentations, we're going to have some time for questions and answers. You can um, ask directly or you can do it as a message. So with that said again, I will pass it to Dr. Demick. Hi, thanks Mustafa. Uh, again, I'm Dick Deming and I'm a cancer doc. And um, the reason that we have a cancer doc talking is there would be no need for HPV vaccines if HPV uh, didn't result in cancer. So. Uh, unlike many of the other um, vaccines that we uh, have in, um, in the United States and around the world that, that are designed to reduce the likelihood of an acute illness due to a virus or a bacteria, we have HPV vaccines because HPV causes cancer. And so what I wanna review with you is not the information about the vaccine itself, but how and what cancers are caused by the human papillomavirus. Um, there are six different cancers that are caused by the human papillomavirus. And we'll talk about each of these separately. You can see all of them listed here. Cervix cancer, 
vaginal cancer and vulvar cancer in women, uh, penile cancer in men, and then anal cancer and oral pharynx cancer, and we'll talk more specifically about that, can be in men or women. So those are the six cancers that are caused by the HPV virus. Um, how does HPV cause cancer? Well, the HPV infects the cells and it interferes with the way that these cells communicate with each other. So what a cancer cell is, it's a mutated cell that no longer behaves uh, nicely in the sandbox. Normally when a cell comes in contact with its neighboring cells, it, it understands that it doesn't need to continue to proliferate. But when the HPV gets into the cells, it affects uh, the ability to, for the cells to regulate their own growth. And it also um, affects the immune system in that environment and leads to the mutation of a normal cell into a cancer cell. Um, again, we're gonna talk about the six different cancers that are known to be caused by HPV. Um, the most well known in the public is cervix cancer. So the cervix is the bottom part of the uterus. It's the last part of the uterus that, that a baby would come through at birth. It's part of the birth canal. When a woman goes in to get a pap smear, the physician is actually scraping off some cells from the cervix. The, the lowest part of the uterus that's up at the top of the vagina. And uh, this is a, a screening test to look for abnormal cells that could be caused uh, by um, cancer. And nearly 100% of cervix cancers are caused by the HPV virus. Um, an even more common HPV cancer that the public doesn't know about as much is oropharynx cancer. And the oropharynx is the part of the throat that you see if you open your mouth and look in the mirror way back at the, the throat. It's the part of your throat where the tonsils are and where the very back of the tongue, we call that the base of the tongue. So it's not part of the mouth, not part of your cheeks or the tongue uh, the tip of the tongue, it's way back in the throat. That is the oral pharynx. Um, it used to be before uh, HPV became so prevalent that the only patients we would see with oral pharynx cancer would be individuals that had other risk factors such as cigarette smoking and alcohol consumption. Now about 70% of oral pharynx cancers are caused by HPV, and we often see them in individuals who don't smoke or drink at all. Um, again, 30, 40 years ago would be very rare to see an oropharynx cancer in someone who didn't have smoking and alcohol consumption. Now it's very common to see um, um, highly educated individuals who don't smoke and drink who have oropharynx cancer. Uh, the third type of cancer is anal cancer, and over 90% of all anal cancers are caused by HPV. So uh, the anus is the very lowest part of the digestive system. It is uh, just the, the inch of the um, uh, lower part of the digestive system uh, right above the anus. Um, and um, that also is a squamous cell carcinoma. I should say that another thing that all of these cancers have in common is the histologic type of the cancer is squamous cell. That is the type of histology that covers the skin of the body, the, the mouth and the throat, and also the lower part of the digestive system and the vagina. Uh, the fourth type of cancer is penile cancer. Penile cancer is very rare. Even though HPV is very, very, very common, the, the chances of developing a penile cancer is exceedingly rare in the United States. For men, um, uh, the most common HPV cancer is the oropharynx cancer, cancer back in the tonsil region. For women, it's the cervix cancer. But for some reason, 
uh, even though the HPV virus is spread by genital to genital contact and also oral genital contact in men, they're much more likely to get an oral pharynx cancer caused by HPV in women much more likely to get a cervical cancer caused by HPV. The last two types of cancer caused by HPV are both in women, uh, vaginal cancer and cancer of the vulva. The vulva is the outer part of the um, introitus of the genitalia of a woman. It's uh, really where the skin comes together right at the opening of the vagina. That's the vulva. And again, almost 70% um, of vulvar cancers in women are caused by HPV. So those are the six types of cancers that we know are caused by HPV. Cervix, oral pharynx, anal, penile, vaginal, and vulvar. Um, I said I'd talk a little bit more about oral pharynx. So here's a picture of a guy with his mouth opened up and the oral pharynx is there in the back. The uvula is the little thing that hangs down off the soft palate. And you can see the tonsils in red there on the right and the left. The lower picture uh, with the big, large red area, that is cancer of this gentleman's right tonsil. Um, oftentimes with oral pharynx cancer, it will spread into the lymph nodes in the neck. The picture on the right, you can see kind of a bump on this guy's left neck. That is an enlarged lymph nodes. And it's very common that someone who has oral pharynx cancer may not appreciate that they have cancer in their tonsil until a lymph node swells up. And that's what prompts them to seek medical attention. Um, this slide shows the new cases that we're likely to see in the United States uh, caused by HPV. Um, you see in women, um, that's the circle on the left and the, uh, the green at the bottom, 11,000 new cases of cervix cancer caused by HPV in the United States um, in a year. And you can see that there's actually more oral pharynx cancer in men than there will be cervix cancer in women. Um, in the, the circle to the left are the distribution of the HPV cancers in women. Cervix dominates, oral pharynx, vulva, and anal are uh, next, and vaginal cancer is rare. In um, men, oral pharynx is 80% of HPV cancers in men are oral pharynx. Very small number have penile cancer and a very small number will have anal cancer. When we look at the impact, uh, um, what I want you to uh, look at here is that middle column with percentages. And those are the percentages of the cancer that is actually caused by the HPV. So some cervix, vaginal, penile, anal, oral pharynx cancer are caused by other things, but um, HPV is the predominant. And in cervix cancer, anal cancer, and um, it's over 90% of those cancers are caused by HPV and a very large percentage of, of vaginal, vulvar, penile, and oral pharynx cancers are caused by HPV. Definite the dominant risk factor in all six of those cancers. Uh, this shows you the HPV-associated cancers and the age of diagnosis in women. So uh, the blue that peaks early, that is cervix cancer. Cervix cancer is much more likely to occur at a younger age. The red is vulvar cancer. Vulvar cancer is much more common to occur in older women. And in fact, when you look at that line, the older a woman is, the more likely that they may develop vulvar cancer. Um, when we look at the age distribution in men, we see that again, oral pharynx cancer is the dominant and it tends to peak at about age, uh, about age 60 and then declines after it. Again, penile cancer and anal cancer are small in comparison to the oral pharynx cancer. Um, this just shows you the same information with uh, different um, graphics looking at cervix cancer peaking at age 49 and the other types of cancers peaking at older age 
with a vulvar cancer probably being the oldest. Um, why do I uh, talk about a little bit about screening? Those are six different types of cancers caused by HPV. Only one of the six cancers do we have a verified screening test, and that is pap smears for cervix cancer. There is no good screening test for vulvar cancer, vaginal cancer, anal cancer, oral pharynx, or penile cancer. So the only one of the six cancers caused by HPV for which there is a good screening test is cervix cancer. All the more reason to have a tool for preventing the cancers rather than having to screen for them after they've already developed. And the reason to do an HPV vaccination is HPV has been proven to prevent cancer. Now, in all honesty, most of the studies have looked at the prevention of cervix cancer. That's where the data is the, the most robust and the strongest, showing that you actually prevent cancers. We have no doubt that when all of the other studies mature, we will find that X HPV vaccination not only prevents cervix cancer, but will prevent the HPV-associated oral pharynx cancer, vulvar, vaginal, anal, and penile cancers as well. So HPV causes cancer. These six different cancers result in death and vaccination can prevent cancer and prevent death. So I'll turn it over to the next speaker. And I think that's Dr. McCoy. Yep. All right, thank you very much, Dick. So. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, send a chat if we can't. So um, these are some discussions that I've had in the past with uh, Mercy One providers. And so I see on the, on the attendance list, there's a couple of Mercy One providers. So this may be uh, a little duplicative for some of you, but, uh, and I don't know exactly our audience tonight. I know Dick Deming is having some folks out at his cancer center out there tonight that are uh, potentially cancer survivors. And, and so some of this approach of HPV vaccination uh, is more focusing on, say, parents of teenagers and parents of nine-year-olds. So it may, may not be quite there, but you probably have some, some grandkids in these ages or some, I think this will be rel relating to everybody. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, Dick and I are trying not to duplicate anything, but these are some things that, uh, these are some slides we put together with the help of American Cancer Society. And so these were some discussions I've given. Um, I gave this talk, I believe, down in the Monroe County uh, Hospital area. I've done this with our Mercy providers here as well. So again, uh, whoops, sorry, no disclosures there. Similar agenda that like Dr. Aldada mentioned previously, some um, I try to not go over as, uh, as much of the HPV 101 since Dr. Deming had gone through some of that, but I am going to talk about this announcement approach training and kind of what we did at Mercy One um, a couple of years ago. It seems like an eternity ago because it was pre-COVID, and as we all know, pre-COVID really wasn't that long ago, but it just seems like forever. Um, I saw in the chat some folks had asked about slides. Um, so some of there's some HPV resources here uh, from American Cancer Society that I'll share. Really a couple very powerful videos that uh, American Cancer Society has put out. Um, probably uh, about three or four years ago, I got involved up at an HPV roundtable and some of the videos um, that uh, we're sharing in these slides later are actually people that I met that were cancer survivors. And so, um, and so very, uh, very powerful in uh, discussion. So uh, these are some things that we will be talking about. And I think we have about 20 minutes to get through some of these. So I'll we'll try not to go too quickly. Um, these are some things that Dick had already talked about. Obviously, uh, the vaccine is, is preventing cancer. And so we are not focusing on, um, on where the focus is on that and not on sexual activity, not on those kind of things. Uh, so that's why we're focusing on that. Like Dick mentioned, uh, I thought we didn't duplicate, but I guess we duplicated a little bit. Uh, so uh, like Dick mentioned, 
uh, six types of cancer, only screening is for cervical. So uh, that is uh, what, what Dick had just mentioned. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks are aware of pap smears like Dick had talked about. This is just some data of precancerous uh, abnormalities that women have with pap smears. So uh, any, any women on the, on the call know the procedure of a pap smear. And this is some numbers of huge, huge numbers of, of low-grade cervical dysplasia, millions of people, maybe not millions, but this, as this mentions, over a million uh, women affected each year with abnormal pap smears, uh, greater than 200,000 new cases of high-grade cervical dysplasia, uh, like Dick mentioned with uh, HPV or pap smear testing, so precancerous. So yes, there's the cancer discussion, but also there is uh, uh, some of these precancerous discussions too that we feel when we can get our HPV rates high as we want them to be, I'll share a little bit of some of the data as well as Dr. Aldada shared some of your data maybe in your counties um, that, that we can make a difference with these, these millions of million women that are having low grade cervical dysplasia, um, <clears throat> pap smears and uh, LEAP procedures are not fun procedures to have. And so um, that's what we're trying to, to focus on. So we, there's a lot of studies about the safety of HPV. I know uh, parents come up with a lot, of, a lot of different discussions about safety. Obviously in our era of COVID, we all uh, understand safety and COVID vaccines, but uh, these were from slides. Dr. Noel Brewer was the, the, the uh, doctor that talked about this announcement approach. So I got some of these slides from him. Some of these are a little bit old from 17, but when I was giving these discussions, it was, like I said, pre-COVID. So hundreds of studies. Uh, this slide I'm sure is, is old by now. And this 2.5 million people uh, in six countries uh, is I'm sure much larger by now. And so uh, we've not seen any serious side effects besides what is typical. I think all of us that give pediatric vaccines are aware that uh, people can pass out, people have reactions, but uh, safety is not an issue and need to update this to see exactly how many more uh, millions I'm sure this, this is since this slide was created. So vaccine schedules, this, these slides again were, were a little bit old, but because now the check mark here, as you can see, uh, starts at age 11 to 12, but there are many societies that are now talking about vaccinating at earlier ages, even down to age nine. Um, so American Cancer Society recommends the, the vaccination between nine and 12. Um, our, our clinic system here at Mercy One is, uh, when I was giving these talks previously, was probably focusing on that 11 to 12 year old age. And so when I talk about the announcement approach later, um, what we do is we, we bundle the discussion because at 11 to 12, they'll need three vaccinations. So if we are gonna move towards that earlier age group, you know, that nine to 10, they don't need the other vaccines at that age. And so, um, so that'll, that, that, that may be changing. And we do know if we give the vaccination earlier, I think I have some slides a little bit later, the vaccine is more effective. We do know if we give the vaccines earlier, it's two doses. So if you here see these two columns here on the left, it's two doses. And if we wait to give the HPV vaccination, it's three doses. So um, I have four children. Uh, if, uh, if I'm going to tell them I may give you two shots versus three shots, they'll take two any day. And so uh, something to, to think about uh, from the uh, timing of the vaccinations. So these are some rates again. These are uh, uh, similar to this, this, the first slide that Dr. Eldada showed. So if you can look, you know, obviously we're in Iowa. Our rates are somewhere around the these this 70 to 79 percent um, with one vaccine. So completion is our goal. And so the first dose, as you can see when I share some of our data at Mercy One, first doses are obviously higher than the second. So we'll talk a little bit more about data in a couple more slides. So I think we're getting there from uh, the new norm. I think we're, you know, if we're, if we're hitting close to 70% of, of our adolescents are starting the HPV series, 
Um, I'll share some of our numbers, like I mentioned here, roughly 51% are fully vaccinated. So we're getting close, but some of our other data that many of you are aware of are other vaccinations with meningitis and, and pertussis are over 80%. So we're getting there. I'm not sure we're there yet. So, you know, finally the new norm, I don't think we're quite there, but we're getting there and I'll show you some of those, some of that data a little bit later. So this talks a little bit about, about, the, about why we would do it at those younger ages, uh, at that nine to nine to 11. You know, we have, uh, we certainly have more chance to vaccinate earlier as, as we all know, our pediatric population, as they age, they come see us less often. And so uh, if they don't, especially if in, in many of our communities, if they don't do sports, um, they sometimes aren't here. And so we have less exposure if we wait. And so as a nine to nine, 10 or 11 year old, we have more exposure to the patients, obviously more chances to vaccinate. And then like I did mention previously, uh, fewer doses for two vaccines versus three vaccines. So um, you know, again, a big may not seem like a lot to uh, parents, but uh, you know, parents that have children, it's 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 a big deal. <laughs> An extra shot is uh, sometimes sometimes a big deal. So, again, these are some things that 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 Dick had already mentioned. Again, the six type of cancers: safety, effective, uh, and we do know that we do have kids that are just not being protected. And so, so what we're trying to focus on is how can we how can we um, increase uh, the kids that are being protected? And so this is where we'll talk about a couple other things. Um, there's been some studies, this again, uh, a little bit old, but you know, a, a very large predictor of vaccine uptake of, of parents saying yes um, is how the provider started the conversation. And so um, when I looked at our attendance list, I saw some providers I recognized, but so I'm not quite sure exactly if we have a lot of providers on or nurses on. I know we have some, some patients on, but um, how the provider started the conversation is very important. And in one of our, in one of the videos that the American Cancer Society talked about uh, later in the, in the presentation, if we have time, I can, I can play that. But it was a, it was a parent that talked about the, the conversation that her provider had. And that, that initial conversation is very important. And so um, if we lead with something like your child is required to get two vaccines of tetanus and meningitis, and the third vaccine isn't required, but you can think about it, and that's HPV. So if we do that, of course, people are going to say, I'll take the two and I'll think about the third one later. And so, so this, this, this particular study mentioned, uh, mentioned the best predictor is how the provider starts the conversation. And so this is where this announcement approach uh, came from. This Dr. Brewer had started this. And so um, when I gave these presentations previously, we actually uh, did this in all of our family medicine and pediatric clinics. And we had front desk staff and nurses and providers. Um, we, would, we would do some role playing. I'll go through some of this a little bit later. Um, and so this, this predictor of uptake is not just by the provider, uh, because, you know, I, I see on the chat, there's a couple uh, nurses that are, are here uh, at Webster County, um, Johnson County Public Health. And so, um, yes, it is, it, this slide mentions provider, but it's not just providers. And so um, this can start uh, at the front desk, this could start with nursing, and obviously can start with um, providers. So this kind of just looks a little bit uh, of this of this announcement approach. And again, this is this is from data previously, or the not data, but the the schedule previously when we would when we would be discussing say three vaccinations. So um, you know if uh, if the provider doesn't recommend it, this study mentioned twenty three percent will get the vaccine. If they kind of say, oh yeah, maybe you could, it it, it goes up, and obviously. Uh, higher than 75, near, nearly three quarters will, will, will say yes for the vaccine if it's highly recommended. And so a couple key statements that we'll talk about later in this announcement approach is recommending it today, is recommending it in between like this, like I mentioned here. So uh, when we did these role-playing exercises in our clinics, you know, one, one, 
one person would be the patient, one person would be the or the or the parent, and one would be the provider. So an example of you know we actually actually had people write down their little their little sentence like this mentioned here. So like this says, Molly needs three vaccines today to protect against meningitis, HPV, cancers, and whooping cough. She will get those at the end of the visit. And so that's the announcement approach in a, in a nutshell. You just say it, you stop, and just kind of pause a little bit. And that's kind of, that's kind of how we had started some of our education sessions. So a lot of barriers that, that we have to overcome. Um, one of them obviously was the recommendation, like I mentioned. Um, obviously, like I mentioned also with the three vaccines, if you're doing it at that 11 to 12, recommending it just like all the others. Um, again, if we're doing this at nine to 10 or nine, nine to 11, that may, that, that, that may need to change just a little bit. Like we talked previously, like even Dick mentioned, HPV is cancer prevention. And then after that, this is where, after this last bullet point is where it sometimes gets a little uncomfortable for providers. Uh, you know, we, we, as providers, you know, you have a busy day, you, you don't want to spend 20 minutes reviewing all this stuff. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. You know, we, you have to offer some empathy that you're, that you care about what they're saying. You can try to give some advice. Um, Dr. Brewer had talked about some data that we can go through. And so these are some of the barriers that, that all of us have probably already had in the past talking about this. So these are not really new. Um, and the first one, I did forget to mention that a little bit. There's some changes in systems and processes that, that can improve this. At the end of our slides, we talk a little bit about some, some evidence-based practices that can sometimes help improve this. Some of these, I feel, are more the second dose than the first dose for HPV, but we'll chat a little bit about that if we have time. So this is kind of, uh, this was from uh, 2018 to, I believe, 2020. So this is a little card that when I did these announcement approaches with providers, staff, uh, schedulers, all these kind of things. This was this was documents that we brought. So, um, you know, I don't, I, you know, if if clinics are interested in this, we can we can talk about this and do this. But the the little card here talks about the three basic principles with the announcement approach: announce, connect, and counsel. And so, like I mentioned, you know, there's the little bullet point, the little uh, first little statement, because Michael's 11, he's due for this. So that's that's the announcement. You know, you. You put the patient's name, you put their age, you put that they're due for this. Um, they mentioned to put to, to bundle the HPV with the cancer in the middle. Um, you don't want to focus one or, one or the other on that. And so that's what this was mentioned. And say you'll vaccinate today and then just kind of wait and see what happens. Um, and if the parent doesn't say much and you move on, then you go through the rest of your, your preventative screening stuff and all the other stuff that you talk about. But if they do hesitate or you pick up on nonverbal cues, you know, these are some things that um, can help. So what's your main concern? Uh, maybe repeat what the, the patient, uh, the, fan, the parent is saying, I hear what you're saying. So these are some things. So um, these are also on the box to the bottom left are some things that, uh, some things that could maybe counteract maybe what, what a parent should talk about. So we talked a little bit about the dosing and the HPV vaccine being more effective at a younger age. So if you're talking to a parent of a nine-year-old that says they're too young, you know, you can, we can bring up here things like kids respond more strongly to when they're younger, better protection, you know, um, the, the sexual activity thing is, is, is obviously there, but I think is, is getting to be less and less. Um, safety we talked about, effectiveness, um, you know, guidelines of, of CDC or American Cancer Society um, uh, are some things that we can talk about. Uh, this was more common right when we started with boys versus, versus girls. Obviously, every one of us remember it was approved first for girls and then approved for boys, which wasn't the greatest plan. Uh, and so we kind of tried to, tried to work through some of that. And then we do mention also about the school requirements again. Uh, school requirements don't keep up with medical science. You know, we obviously we know that uh, with our experience with COVID. You know, how many times were we arguing of of school requirements for kids getting back into school with COVID versus 
CDC's guidance or um, it, with our adult population. How many, I don't remember how many times I was doing COVID tests in my clinic with patients that needed a negative COVID to go back to work, even though I knew it was not medical science. And so we're very well aware of that. And so, so this is this uh, announcement approach kind of in a summary. Uh, over to the right hand side, we sometimes did some role playing, obviously can't do that in a webinar. Um, and so we actually would have a provider write down their, their statement um, and then maybe potentially look at some messages of, of some, some concerns of hesitant parents. And then, and then we then then we we did some role playing again. It was a little awkward, you know, at, at times, um, but but we went through that. And then, obviously, the parent can do um, the role playing the same way. So that's the announcement approach uh, discussion. And I think most of these slides kind of go through it a little bit more. So again, I'm going to skip through some of these because the announcement approach. I wanted providers and and nurses and and folks on the call to be aware of it. Um, I'm actually still working with Dr. Brewer in a study that we're, that we're uh, going to be still continuing to look at this research. So, so again, the, this, this kind of was part of Dr. Brewer's discussions about provider recommendations that we kind of already talked about. You know, without a recommendation, 25% or somewhere around that, um, and that number obviously is going to go up closer to 75% with that recommendation. So mentioned that previously. Again, this, this is kind of slide for slide with, with this announcement approach. So again, I'm not going to uh, go through all of this because we kind of went through that with that summary page. So again, if they do have a concern, what's your main concern? Um, these are some examples. It doesn't seem safe. You know, I, I understand that you're concerned about safety and then you go through some of the some of the data. So counseling is kind of what you do would do next. And then lastly, after the counseling, I think the next slide talks about um, many times, oh sorry, this is more more about hesitancy. So sorry, these are again those same tested things on that card. Again, good for your good for your um, for your knowledge that we already chatted about. Um, but what I was gonna say was eventually many people do say yes. And so um, that's, I think another couple of slides, sorry about that. So again, just as through the announcement approach, I just gotta get through a couple of these. Just gotta get through these, sorry. We're running a little bit on time, just a couple other things. There's some tips again. These all will be shared. This was a little bit of the follow-up after the initial, maybe the initial no. Um, parents do, most do get to yes. Um, this is where maybe some of your processes might be an issue. Um, I was on a call just a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Brewer's team about some future discussions. And one, one pediatrician that, um, I talked to, I think he was out in the Pennsylvania area. He actually sends a task to his nurse in two weeks and says, hey, Dr. Dr. McCoy mentioned you were in for HPV and you weren't sure about the HPV vaccine. And he wanted me just to circle back and, and see what your thoughts were. And, and granted, you know, granted, that may create some more discussion, but you know, at least it tells the patient that you care, that you heard them, that you understand, you know, will they come in for a nurse only HPV? Uh, without an office visit, probably not. But I think that was an interesting comment that uh, somebody said. About half will get it later. Um, another quarter will plan to. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, certainly you have to bring it up at the next visit. Sorry, my slide. There we go. So these are some, this is some of the data that, that we did again. January of 19 seems like uh, an eternity. So what I did mention previously was meningitis and Tdap in these in this purple columns on the far left are, are close to 90%. And so back in January of 19, our, our first dose completion was around 66% for females, about 61% for males. Again, uh, still, still battling that whole males versus females with HPV. 
And then our completion rates were around 40% for females, as you can see, and about uh, really quite low with males of 33. And so when we combine those on the far right, these were some of our data, 63% completion of the first dose, uh, pushing 40% of completion and still 90s uh, of the other vaccines uh, typical given. So then, uh, so then what we did was, this is just a little bit of a summary, but then what we did was uh, went through our announcement approach and our, our completion rates um, for combined went closer to 70, our, or sorry, our first dose was closer to 70, our, our second, our completion dose for combined was close to 45. And so this, I think, uh, was a little bit of a summary. We had a, uh, you know, some of these increases uh, to me were a little lower than I was hoping, you know, 4% increase of females with first dose and 6% completion, um, you know, 5% five, 5 combination increase and 8% increase completion. But when I originally looked at this data, I was like, well, that seems kind of low, but um, actually, I think it was was pretty pretty decent. Um, so, uh, last couple things on the slides here are some resources from American Cancer Society, and so there's some there's a lot of documents behind all these things about some other evidence based practices of of other ways to do to increase your immunization rate. So. I don't know if many of you have standing orders. Um, I think we've not utilized those much at Mercy at Mercy One. I think we're. I'd like to potentially introduce maybe a, a second dose standing order. I think a standing order for a first might be a little bit difficult, um, but that might be something. Uh, provider reminders. So this is where I talked about previously with processes making your changes. So I don't know how many of you. As a provider, if you give an HPV vaccination, do you put in a reminder for the second one or do you just wait till they come back? And so that's some other ways that, that maybe some processes can change. Uh, client reminders and recalls like we mentioned there. Well, these are a couple, some evidence-based interventions with American Cancer Society that, that uh, you can look through. These are some of the resources. I think I might have time if I can make it work. I always never wonder how technology is going to work with this, but um, I, I think we'll probably have time for a video. So these are some videos over here. I don't think they're. I don't think I can link to it. Um, I don't think I can. But um, the, the this these are some of the this um, this here this Chris's message. If we can. If we could, if we could get the link that way, Chris was the 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 wife of I think Steve or John, I can't remember which one it was, who had oropharyngeal cancer. And so I was at a conference, like I mentioned, up in Ankeny about four, maybe five years by now, and they were there speaking, and their son was there. Um, I think maybe John might be the maybe the husband, and Steve might be the, the teenage child. And so some of these were very powerful messages about about this. So um, hopefully we can get these to, uh, it looks like Elizabeth is sharing the links there um, to those videos. So uh, again, very powerful. I think, um, you know, an, the, the provider's recommendation was Chris's big message um, because she shared, she shared in her video that, you know, she goes to, um, she goes to, every time before her child and her go to the doctor's office, the child says, what, what immunizations am I due for? And literally they, she mentioned that when she saw her, her provider, I don't know, you know who it was, but they mentioned that they said, like I mentioned previously, you're due for these vaccinations and all oh, this HPV one you might consider, you know? And so that uh, shocking that, that, that's, that was where, um, you know, we didn't get a big uptake in that. So, those are some resources and thank you for sharing those. And I think those are close to what we have. There's a couple more resources here. The American Cancer Society does put these, these action guides. I printed some of these off. These are actually ways that, that systems can try to um, can try to can try to make some changes. So these are all documents that are, uh, the American Cancer Society has put together. 
And I believe, I believe that might do it for those slides. So I guess maybe a couple questions, you know, I think we've got some questions that we can answer and thank you for uh, some links of the video. Thank you for putting that in there, Elizabeth. Um, there's some links to Iowa Department of Public Health as well. Um, you know, so if anybody has anything to share, we'll, we'll share out those resources, but um, I think we are up to our question and answer session. So Dr. Aldada, any comments from your perspective? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Deming and Dr. McCoy for this nice presentation. I think the information you shared with us is definitely very valuable. You know, knowing the burden of the cancer on individuals, I'm glad we heard about, it's not only about cervical cancer, but learning about other cancers like oropharyngeal, you know, um, I think that's something sometimes we miss to talk about to our patients. And thank you, Dr. McCoy, for sharing with us the approach to the families to tell them about the vaccine. I will share something simple about my experience with the, since we started to have the vaccine. Number one, we all, as a clinicians, we learned more about the HPV infection and its, I would say, consequences. Uh, number two, I think our experience with talking about the HPV vaccine to our families got much better compared to two or three years ago. When the vaccine first came to the market, we were somewhat also, I would say, not very knowledgeable about how to approach families. But that approach that Dr. McCoy is trying to teach us, I think it's a very practical way. It became part of our language. When we go to the room for all those patients at age 11 or 12, we say it exactly as simple as that. You know, the kid needs today the Tdap and the HPV plus the meningitis vaccine. So it became as a routine. But even the nursing staff, I would say they became much, much better talking about it. So thank you again for sharing with us that information. Um, one more thing I may add to it. I personally and most of our clinics, we learned one thing. When we give them the dose today, when they leave, we give them a small piece of paper to say, uh, please schedule your next uh, like shot in six months. This way, we make sure that they will schedule before they leave the clinic to minimize the risk like they go home and they forget about it. Granted, we may see them again in a year for their well child visit, but just in case they don't show up, that's another hint probably. And part of the chat, I think one of the nurses mentioned something that she has a recall system. I think that's a very nice thing. I hope everybody can share with us their experiences. And with that said, please, let's go ahead and have some questions and answers now. Please feel free to type any questions into the chat box. If sure. you feel more comfortable, you are welcome to unmute your line and maybe even open up your video if you want us to see you and, and ask some questions live as well. So I, we'll just leave a few minutes for that. Yeah, I, I, I liked uh, David Thomas's comment about hesitant teen boys. Uh, vaccine presents penile cancer, and one of the treatments is to cut off the penis. That that's a good one. I that that that's got to be evidence based there. So that's <laughs> that's pretty good. Looks like a couple of people are doing the scheduling the nurse visits at the time for the second dose. So again, great great process. Um, again, how can how can we make things work work easier and there's enough, there's enough that providers have to do. And so any way that we can try to make that easier would be great. Mustafa, do you want to, any other questions? Um, I would say, like, this is probably a question to, to Dr. Demon. From your experience, uh, like, do you feel the patients, they ask about HPV vaccine after the fact they end up with cancer? And the main reason why I'm mentioning this, like I remember with some infections before, like pneumococcal infection. Unfortunately, those patients, when they had pneumococcal infection, the family was asking, well, we heard about a pneumococcal vaccine, for example. That was years ago before PCV, like once PCV was uh, uh, in the market. So if you can elaborate to us about that. Yes, yes. Sometimes I, I do get asked about it. 
Um, again, the two most common cancers that we see are cervix cancer in women and oral pharynx cancer in men. Uh, occasionally, you'll have a young patient in her 20s with cervix cancer. Uh, now, a young patient in her 20s um, would have had the opportunity to have had the vaccine. But if they haven't had the vaccine, there are opportunities um, to get vaccinated later in life. And I apologize um, as, as I'm not someone who gives vaccines, but over the years, the age at which you could give a vaccine has gone up. But once you have the cancer, giving the vaccine is not going to be useful in that particular patient's cancer. So uh, it's the opportunity to prevent the most cancers comes when boys and girls are vaccinated um, in their uh, preteens and early teens. That's the best opportunity for vaccination. Sure. I see some questions on the chat. I'm going to start with this one. The question is, do you, do your, do you have your parents sign the consent for your vaccines? Uh, usually, yes. And if they send the patient, let's say, you know, 16 and older, for example, they may drive themselves. Um, we try to always make sure I would say from practical standpoint, we try to make sure the parent is aware about the vaccine. Uh, we have a few instances, I would say, the parent may want it and the kid doesn't want it, that's easy, but there's the one that the kid wants it and the parent does not. We try to always have some reasoning with the parent. So if I have, let's say a 16 or 17 year old who's coming and said, I want the vaccine, but my parents don't. I'm like, yes, you have a choice, but we try to maintain good relationship with the parents. And luckily for those of you, I would say situations, we were able to convince the parents by saying, you know what, the, your young child is going to be like a young adult soon, and they are trying to make good choices about their health. So probably I would give them some freedom to make good choice. And luckily we have good luck with that. Uh, any but he wants to, to say anything about that part, about parents signing the consent for the vaccine. Um, I will move to the next one. The question is about, um, do the attendees here still see some hesitancy with this vaccine uh, or the COVID vaccine is the new bad one? I think that's a great question. Um, the HPV vaccine, what, before COVID epidemic, I think it was relatively the bad vaccine like we have to convince families about. Now the COVID probably we have to, to, to discuss more in depth. Um, I think part of it with the COVID, you're right. People probably got distracted with the COVID. I am seeing less hesitancy or resistance about the HPV. But I think mostly because the public now, they learned more about it. They hear about it probably at school. They hear about it on TV, social media. So I, I saw some advertisement on TV about HPV, to be honest with you. So I think that increased the awareness of families. I don't know if Dr. McCoy, Dr. Deming have anything to say about that. Yeah, I, I probably agree. I mean, I think um, I would agree. It's probably It's probably more COVID than that. Uh, I don't the, know, Good, Laura, I think you have a great question uh, with H Dick. I know you mentioned a little bit about vaccinating at, at older ages, and I know there's been, there has been increased ages. Um, and I, I think, I don't think we have a good sense if, if what insurance covers at what age and what insurance company and all that. So I, I totally agree with you, Laura. I think we can I can circle back with our payers here at Mercy One to help you out, uh, but I, I guess I would be interested if any other any of the folks on the call have noted have found anything about that because yeah, I really have no clue which insurance companies would cover it. I think the majority would, but again, and I think the same problem with um, you know kids, especially seeing adults like infrequently trying to like. Even I'm hesitating with, um, you know, like something like a Cologuard test because something kicks back on that one patient that if I give it to them and they're hesitant, if it's going to be covered, like a lot of times that's the factor. And if it's not covered, getting them to come back 
but then usually, I mean, I had like a 29 year old who was really, you know, worried and she was like, okay, like she was really motivated, you know, to come back and she did call her insurance, but I feel like that extra step, sometimes we can't, you know, know. And I just didn't know if how other people approach it or if they've had much success getting older patients, um, you know, vaccinated. I can mention one thing about it. The vaccine is recommended like universally through age 26. So 27 and through 45, there is what they call the shared decision-making process. So I would say probably those are the patients that maybe we can ask the patient, can you call your insurance company to see if they allow it? So they don't get the cost as a private, you know, I mean, out of pocket. Sure. Yeah, Laura, I can circle back with our billers and see kind of what we're seeing here in central Iowa, but I guess I would be interested if anybody on the call has any, any experience with that. There is a nice, uh, I would say, question or statement here, like about hesitant girls and their mothers and knowing that there are many girls are victims of date rape. Um, I don't know if anybody want to elaborate more about that. Mustafa, this is Dick, and I don't want to elaborate about that, but you know, I think uh, I see several comments and it would appear to me that one of the best strategies is not to focus on the sexual relationships, but on preventing cancer. And as many of the comments have, have pointed out, cancer is a big, scary disease that, you know, kills 600,000 individuals in the United States. And to have something as simple as a vaccination to prevent cancer, um, that, that leading with that, and I, I defer to you guys as, as primary care docs, because I don't vaccinate individuals, but it would seem that, uh, individuals knowing that the reason we're doing the vaccination is to prevent cancer is a very strong uh, piece of information that can influence parents and children in making a decision to become vaccinated. And you are very right. I think that's one of the messages we always try to tell families, like this particular vaccine is to prevent cancer, because most of the time the families are focusing on vaccines to prevent infections like direct infection where they see, talk about whooping cough or talking about mumps, measles, rubella, things like that. But this one, you're right, the message has to go direct like we're preventing cancer as the ultimate goal. I kind of wonder if the primary care docs, even though we don't say this and nobody says this, but the, the relationship with HPV and sexual activity, whether some parents think, well, this is a vaccine to prevent STDs and, you know, sort of miss the big picture that it's a vaccination to prevent cancer. That's very true. And I can add a personal story about it. I remember when the vaccine was new, one of the dads brought the teenager and he told me, can we give her the sex vaccine? So... <laughs> my nurse told me about it before I went to the room. I thought I couldn't really understand what she meant. But when I went to the room, the dad said it again. So I tried to explain to him, this is number one, the vaccine is not to encourage young ones to have sexual activity at early age. Number two, it's not, it has nothing to do with the STD as a, as a indication. It's primarily about uh, like cancer prevention. So thank you, Dr. Deming, for emphasizing to us the importance about the, the cancer prevention part. Yep. I see a question here. If most if the most common age of oral pharynx cancer is 60, what recommendations should be given to older men with risk factors? So I'm not sure if I understand the question exactly. Sort of the, the peak age is 60. Certainly, I've seen uh, oral pharynx cancer in men in their 40s, so it does happen even younger. Um, so um, in terms of the other risk factors, the other risk factors that I spoke about were uh, tobacco consumption and alcohol consumption. And so those should be part of just um, how to reduce risk of cancer is you don't uh, smoke, you uh, moderate your alcohol consumption, you get phys daily physical exercise, you maintain a normal body weight, 
you eat uh, nutritious foods, you uh, watch for sun exposure. Those are sort of classic things one can do to reduce the risk of getting cancer in general. With the oral pharynx cancer, again, it's the alcohol consumption and cigarette smoking. So uh, cigarettes doesn't don't just cause lung cancer, they cause many other types of cancer, including oral pharynx cancer. Uh, but I don't know if the question was intended to at what point do you continue to vaccinate individuals you know, after the age of 27 to 46? I don't know the science. I know that it is allowed and probably you're going to get the most effectiveness in preventing cancers if individuals have not yet been sexually active and intend to become sexually active. But um, that would uh, uh, be a, a reason to maybe consider vaccinating at an older age. But I have to admit, um, I don't know the science on which individuals over the age of 27 are most benefited by getting a vaccine at that age. There's another question, Dr. Deming, maybe you can uh, touch on, which is about women diagnosed with cervical cancer more likely to develop other HPV cancers. Um, great, great question. I suspect they are, especially the vulva and vaginal, that if you already have a HPV cancer caused by one of the strains of HPV that causes cancer, that uh, the, the, the risk would go up, but I don't know the data on that directly. So I apologize, I can't answer with evidence. And there then, is a nice statement here about, uh, you know, working in a surgical floor specializing in oropharyngeal cancer and the emphasis on continuing oral healthcare. I think that's a very nice message that everybody needs to see the dentist. I know myself, when I go to the dentist, they check my mouth to tell me like, there is no obvious lesion they can see. So that's that's a very good statement. Um, there is this here the about running into issues with school administrators keep telling us the HPV is controversial. I think we need to have more education to the society in general, like, um, people need to learn more about the HPV infection and the complications, which is basically the cancer part. Um, I think this is the part that we need to educate on our end, whether a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA or a nurse, anybody involved in the Department of Public Health, anywhere we have to keep pushing the message to the schools to, to educate everybody. Um, you know what, it's 6.32. It's a great, you know, gathering. I just would like to thank uh, Kelly and Pam from the Iowa Academy of Family Physicians and also to thank uh, Elizabeth from Iowa, Immuniza Iowa Immunizes Coalition for gathering us all together here. I would like to thank all the audience for their great questions and participation. And lastly, to thank Dr. McCoy and Dr. Deming for sharing their information with us. I'm sure many of you know them very well. They both have a great experience in their fields. They've been serving the community for many years. And with that said, I would like to say thank you again and have a wonderful night.